Hello and thanks for joining in with this podcast. The uh, idea of this podcast is uh, really just to talk about uh, how science is done and how it relates to uh, just everyday things. Uh, a lot of questions that I get asked uh, in my science class would be, uh, why do I need to learn this? Or am I going to use this? And I think that scientific literacy really is the most important aspect of anyone's education in science is if you understand how to interpret information, if you know how to ask critical questions, if you can um, look at data and, and make a, a judgment about whether it's uh, valid or if it's just junk science, uh, that's really going to be a, a huge takeaway, even if you're um, not going to become a professional scientist. So this uh, focus is called doing science, so if you're following along and taking uh, lecture notes for my class, then you can see the arrangement of the Cornell Notes format on your screen. So the idea for this podcast uh, began several months ago. Uh, my niece Brianna had texted me a, a web link to a, a website and it featured um, an experiment that was done and the question was uh, what damage, if any, does a microwave do to, uh, to water or to really to any of our food? So do, does the uh, microwave pose any health risks to, to humans as we use them. You can do a, a quick search on, on Google and, and um, see lots of different um, websites that are featuring that question. So this is what I call Kids Play. Uh, section 2 of, the, of this podcast deals with an experiment that was done by uh, someone's granddaughter. Again, the, the description on the net where I found this was a little bit vague. Uh, there was a science fair done in 2006, and uh, this person's granddaughter wanted to test the effect of microwave water versus purified water. So I thought it was really cool because you know here's this uh, young person that's trying to use science to answer a question, and so I was I was excited to to take a look at this to dive in, and, and as I was looking at all the different uh, facts in there, uh, there was some great stuff that was uh, set up, and then there were some obvious uh, omissions or things that were not done um, uh, fully well and so I think that the conclusion that was that was arrived at was probably incomplete or incorrect um, because of the way that it was set up. So let's take a look at um, some details of this. So essentially the setup was in you know, two containers of, um, of water uh, and one, the water had been boiled uh, by a conventional stove to, to boiling, and then it was let to be cooled, and then it was used to water uh, a plant over some number of days. And then the, um, the other group was um, water with uh, water that was heated by microwave to boiling, and then it was also allowed to cool down. Beyond mention of the, the two different kinds of waters that were being heated by different means and the same plant, there weren't a lot of details that were added. So let's take a look at kind of some pros and cons. So on the pro, there was a clear cause and effect. They were trying to link the um, activity of microwave energy on the structure of water and does that have any negative effect on plants. Uh, both uh, forms of water were cooled to allow uh, um, the plants not to be scalded when uh, they were watered and then they used the same type of plant and on the con side, um, as they went through the experiment, you'll see in the pictures that the leaves have been pruned back at various times. And I didn't understand why that was done. That would seem to interfere with any data collection. Uh, and then there weren't a lot of other controlled variables that were used. Uh, they didn't mention um, like what the temperature was in container one versus two. They didn't mention if there was fertilizer being used on one versus the other. Uh, they didn't mention uh, the kind of soil that was that was used. Uh, so, so maybe those were done properly, but it just wasn't communicated in this particular um, website that I went to. Um, and they didn't really mention the kind of hard data that were collected. Uh, they really kind of mentioned um, looking at the leaves, the number of leaves, the, the quality of the leaves, but it wasn't a matter of um, number of uh, leaves that were grown per day or the overall uh, length of the stem or um, how much biomass in terms of like the, the, the weight of the leaves was produced. So there really wasn't a real clear sense of what that responding variable were, was or the 
um, the dependent variable. And it seemed like from the get-go that the experiment seemed biased, at least from the point of view of this grandparent who's writing about this science fair. It already seemed like they had a pretty strong bias that microwaves do cause um, damage to things even as simple as water. And then in the conclusion, um, there were a lot of more far-reaching conclusions or connections being made that really weren't the focus of the experiment and they really weren't justified. There was no data to say that these things were true. So here's the, uh, the text that I uh, took a screenshot of and you can read um, the, the whole text for yourself, but I want to just bring your attention to the line where it says, um, it's how it corrupts the DNA and the food so the body cannot recognize it, so the body wraps it in fat cells to protect itself from the dead food, or it eliminates it fast. And then it goes on to mention um, mothers heating up milk and, and, and uh, safe appliances and whatnot. And so they're, they're taking data collected from plants and they're sort of making a far-reaching connection to um, the human body and how we digest food and, and there's an assumption that microwave energy corrupts DNA. Um, well, we digest our food, so the DNA molecules, they're just broken down into their building blocks. And then your body takes those building blocks and then just builds more DNA. So. Uh, again, whether or not that happens, uh, I think the jury is out. I've not yet seen any um, hard evidence to suggest that, that it's, that it's correct. Um, but again, it, they're making a, in a, a conclusion that really is not supported even by the experiment that they've done. So again, it just seems like there's just a lot of you know, bias in this conclusion. Uh, so there's a, a website, Stopes.com, and, and this website looked at the experiment that was done, and they actually did uh, a follow-up experiment, much more controlled. They had uh, multiple plants um, in each uh, group, control versus experimental. They had several types of plants. So the question is, uh, would uh, microwave water affect one type of plant, say a geranium, differently than say a rose bush. And then they did repeat it um, a number of times and they collected some some hard data and uh, they came up with very different results. Uh, so in explanation of maybe what happened in this young girl's science fair project, they came up with the idea that maybe there was a residual contaminant that hindered the, the plant growth in the plants in the experimental group, or maybe it was the soil or the bedding material that was that was introducing some sort of um, um, agent that hindered the growth. So, are there other reasonable explanations um, that can explain the conclusion, other than just say the water? So we call that validity. So validity means how valid is your experimental uh, conclusion, the data that it is based upon. Um, and so there are lots of errors that can compromise the validity of an experiment. So you always want to be aware of that. And then the second key thing is called reliability. And that basically means that if one um, experiment is done by one individual, that it can be done in the same way. And if it's really showing true science, some principle or concept, then it should be seen again and again and again. So the authors at the, the uh, Snopes.com website, I think, correctly point out that any valid scientific conclusion um, can be drawn only from experimentation that is including con uh, the conducting of multiple trials where there's carefully controlled conditions, uh, things that they, and from my limited uh, knowledge, um, were not evidenced in that uh, science fair project. And then there could be other extraneous factors that could have produced the results that were seen in the original science fair project. And again, I, I think it's great that this science fair project was, was done. I think it's great that a question, a real meaningful question was, was created and that there was a plan to, to do the, um, the actual investigation. I just think that there are some areas that could have been improved. Um, and so I think that just is um, something that will come with time. So uh, my hat's off to this uh, young uh, boy or girl that did this. I think that takes a lot of uh, courage and, 
and uh, that's pretty cool. So kind of wrapping up, doing science, what does that really require? So you have to have uh, one single cause against one single effect. So it's the manipulated variable or the independent variable versus the dependent variable, otherwise known as the responding variable. And if you have maybe multiple things changing, then it's difficult to pinpoint what is the exact connection between that um, cause and effect. Uh, we need to collect good precise data. I think that would be a criticism that I would bring out with this science fair project. That it didn't seem like there was really good, solid, clear data. Uh, there were pictures and there were um, changes, of course, but again, um, they were not repeatable. So when Snopes.com did the follow-up, they got different results. Uh, there was no graph table, there was no um, data, no math involved. So it, it, if it was you know, a rate of growth per day or a number of leaves that were produced within a in the first two week period, or if it was just the total amount of biomass that was created, you know, those are all quantitative things. Those are things that can be measurable with numbers. And so uh, I know that by seeing some follow-up experiments, um, the real hard science can root out what was junk science versus what's really good science. And it seemed like there were some poor conclusions that were made from data that was incomplete and also that uh, data that was biased. And so, you know, honest investigations is as unbiased and as objective as we can be, those are hallmarks of good science. And then lastly, the scientific explanation needs to be able to be revised or changed to better match uh, reality. So if there are errors or um, flaws in the design or the, the carrying out uh, or the execution of that experiment, then we should be always aware of that. And then when we try those again, um, we will be able to improve the quality of the data and then really improve the quality of the conclusion because good conclusions are based on good quality data. So this is a quick run through of just an example that was out there on the net that um, was um, erred in some ways and had some really great aspects in another. But if, if you're not scientific literate, if you're not looking at um, business or commerce or politics uh, or the world at large through the lens of science and being able to tease apart, well, what's good quality science? and what's junk science, you're going to be probably uh, misled more often than not. So again, scientific literacy is really about uh, making good choices, good decisions based on, on good data. So people that are informed and, and can process things through kind of this analytical lens, I think they're going to be better off. So uh, thanks for joining me and I appreciate uh, you uh, following along and hopefully you got something out of this. Thank you.